Talk and Rock Radio, where friends meet at the intersection of life, inspiration, and music. Here's your host, Rick Kern. Welcome, everyone, to Talk and Rock Radio. My special guest today is the voice of a legendary singer whose hit song rose to number three on Billboard's Hot 100 in early 1963. Joining me from Los Angeles, California, was the lead singer for the Cascades, John Claude Gamo. How you doing, John? Oh, I'm doing fine. I'm, you know, for an old man, I'm doing great. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you can ask for, right? Absolutely. You know, I'm just happy when I get up in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, John, I'm uh, major fan of, of the Cascades all these years, you know, and I, I want to talk to you a little bit today about, well, your life story as, as be, you know, being a musician and how it all started for you. I guess it was around 1960 or so, I guess, right? Uh, yeah, I was in the Navy. <laughs> yeah. And I I, uh, I flew courtesy of the U.S. government from my hometown of Cleveland, Ohio, flew out to San Diego where I went through uh, basic training. And I, um, I, when I got out of basic training, uh, I went aboard a ship, the USS Jason, which has long been decommissioned. And... Uh, it was on that ship that I began to meet people that uh, that had a, a common interest in music, and I had uh, I had never performed or never been uh, anybody who even thought of myself as being someone who would ever wind up performing or recording, for that matter. I mean, I I knew I could sing, and I used to do a lot of it in my car when I was a teenager, having all my buddies telling me, "Shut up, John." <laughs> 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 well, so it was, uh, you know, I, uh, that's where it all started. And I, ha I have, uh, special, uh, feelings for the, for the people aboard that ship that I got hooked up with who helped me, uh, rise above my insecurities and my feelings about going on stage and, uh, literally <laughs> kind of pulled me up there and almost made me do it. And I, after I did it a few times, I thought, hey, this is kind of fun. <laughs> we'll talk about the Silver Strands. Well, the Silver Strands were kind of a, uh, I would say, a country rock uh, a shipboard band. And uh, they were uh, the drummer in the band, Dave Wilson, who's long passed away. David and I used to go into his office, and, uh, and Lenny Green, who was... Uh, uh, in the engine engine department, he would come in with his guitar, and we would sit and sing uh, Everly Brothers songs. I mean, I'm, God bless the Everly Brothers. They really were a big influence on my early years. And uh, the they finally, the Silver Strands got me, uh, and we uh, the Silver Strands eventually became, there was another group formed called the Thunder Notes, and the Thunder Notes uh, were doing mostly instrumental music, but some singing. Because uh, David, the drummer, was a good singer, and he uh, eventually they got me up on stage to sing with Dave, and uh, we would sing Everly Brothers songs. And uh, before long, I was doing solo things, uh, Bobby V songs, uh, uh, songs by some of the uh, you know the young male singers of the day, and. Uh, 
I was, you know, and eventually we were working, you know, four or five nights a week. And it was, uh, there was, there were times we even flew out of San Diego and uh, did shows. And I had to be back to the ship at, you know, sharp Monday morning, eight o'clock. Wow. And uh, it was sometimes very, very close. <laughs> the, uh, you all did a recording. I think you did one recording called Thunder Rhythm, right? Yes, we did for Bob Keen at Delphi, Delphi Records, I think it was. Bob's died now. Yes. And uh, that was the same label that had Richie Valens. Well, and also, uh, you know, Bob Keen, uh, I've got a personal attachment to that in that uh, our local uh, famous group, the Bobby Fuller Four, were also uh, uh, working with Bob Keen out there at at that time. Well, in 1966 is when he was, when he met his demise, you know, Uh with the tragic loss of, of Bobby then. But, but, uh, yeah, I know a lot of stories about Bob Keen. I'm sure you probably do yeah. as well. Yeah, well, he also had, do you remember uh, that song, Those Oldies But Goodies Remind Me Of You? That was one of his records. Oh, okay. And and I forget the name of that group that did it, but uh, that that was a big hit for, the, for Bob Keen's label. And it was... Uh, the, the thing we did was called Thunder Rhythm, and on the other side was a song called Payday, which was, and they were both instrumental, and they, they didn't really, um, I don't think they promoted it very well, but, you know, it, I don't think it was such a great record anyway when I, in retrospect, you know, thinking back, I don't think it was, you know, uh, I, I really don't think it was meant to be a hit. But, you know, at least it got us started, and we... Um, I don't even remember how we got involved with Bob Keane. It's been so long. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, it was a, a fun experience, and uh, we went back to our back to the drawing board, and by then we were doing a lot more vocal stuff. And uh, we would get together uh, a lot of times during the week when we had time and uh, go into the guest house of our bass players. Uh, the, ba- the bass player's family had a guest house in the in, in, out behind their house, and we turned that into our rehearsal studio, recording studio, and we had an old webcore tape recorder, and we'd go out there and uh, and make demos on this thing. Sure. And when I, they were bad. I mean, these demos were not that great. But you know, it it doesn't take much for somebody, you know, like the the first person who heard these demos, aside from our manager, was Barry Devorzon at uh, Valiant Records. Valiant. Yeah. Yes. And he saw something there that, uh, you know, a, a good, a good, a better demo wouldn't have made much difference. He just uh, he saw the raw talent. He saw the raw talent, yeah. And uh, we got together, and he said, you know, there was like thirty songs on this tape we submitted to him. We got together with him, and he said, okay. He says, who wrote this song? There's a reason. And so I, I told him I did, and, and he says, and that's you singing, right? And I said, yeah. And he says, okay, from now on, you are the uh, the new lead singer. And he said, uh, we want to record There's a Reason, and there's another song on here called Rhythm of the Rain, and we want to record that. And uh, he didn't pick any of the other things that the other guys had written. So, I, I, I mean, literally, I fell into... <clears throat> being lead singer of the group and uh and at, like i said at that particular point we were called the thunder notes yeah. and he immediately said he says that song that name he says is not uh he says i don't like it and he says we got to change your name so we were there in his uh home over in the um i don't know some place around uh Laurel Canyon up in the hills, Mulholland Drive. Mm -hmm. And uh, he started looking around the room, and we were all sitting there uh, thinking. And and, uh, he looked over on the kitchen sink, and there was a container of Cascade dishwashing soap. (laughs) (laughs) And and he said, that's it. He says, you're going to be the Cascades. (laughs) And and that's that's where the name came from. You know, uh, initially, a lot of people in the business and, and DJs, people like that, they thought that we were named after the, the mountains up in the Northwest. Yeah. 
but we were named after a dishwashing soap. <laughs> that that has more of a spiritual connection, I think, when, you know, the Cascade Mountains, you know, not some lousy dishwashing detergent. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but it's, it's kind of funny. It's, it is it's, funny. Uh, I, I just get a, you know, a bang out of it when I think about it. <laughs> of course, uh, you were talking a moment ago about There's a Reason, and of course that was a, a regional hit for you guys in 62, right? Exactly. Yeah, we we uh, it came out I think in the summer of '62, uh, about two months before I was discharged from the Navy, and uh, it, you know we we did a couple of gigs up and down the coast, you know, promoting the record, and uh, it was not very. Um, it was you know we got played on the West Coast, and there were people on the course on the West Coast, uh, like down in San Diego, that that knew who we were, and and some of them were. Um, willing to play the record and uh, sure, and I think you know it was a pretty good record for the time and uh, and it uh, like I said, like you said, regional hit and not much more. You know, you... I think it gave, I think it gave the uh, the DJs around the country a taste of what the Cascades were about and what they could do. Sure, and I know you all were influenced a lot by the Beach Beach Boy vocal harmony, uh, which which leads me right into. What happened soon after, uh, you know, with uh, with there's a reason. Of course, you guys went over to Gold Star Studios in L.A. and uh, right. recorded your uh, your song "Rhythm of the Rain" that you wrote um, along with the legendary Wrecking Crew, uh, which had backing right. musicians uh, including Hal Hal Blaine on drums, Carol Kay on bass, and Glenn right. Campbell on guitar. Talk talk about what that experience must have been like for you. It was it well. I mean. Being as, as young and, and still wet behind the ears, uh, man, I mean, I uh, it was exciting for me. I wasn't exactly, um, I didn't know who these people were when I, you know, recorded with them. And, uh, I mean, even Glenn Campbell was not very well known back in the year, in 62. Right. He had, he had not had any hit records. He'd not uh, uh, had a TV show, which all that stuff happened for him later. But he, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, he was he played on on uh, rhythm of the rain and uh, was Tommy Tedesco in on that session also, or was it just Glenn on guitar? I'm not really sure, but I wouldn't be surprised if Tommy was there. Yeah, and I remember the the strings were done by a guy named Sid Sharp. He was the one who put the string players together. Okay, uh, we didn't use a lot of strings. We used there were strings on. Uh, there's a reason, and there were strings on some of the other things, but uh, I don't think there's any violins of any kind or any kind of that type of instrument on Rhythm of the Rain. And, of course, the sound at the beginning of Rhythm of the Rain was a celeste mm-hmm. and an organ and an organ combined. Oh, nice. And, uh, yeah, and it uh, it worked. And It sounded like God rain, for, yeah. Yeah, thank God for Perry Botkin Jr., who did the arrangement. Yeah. And he's the one that came up with that marvelous figure on the beginning. Oh yeah, he came up with that, you know, and it uh, it fit right in, and and it was Barry Dvorzon's idea to open the song with the uh, crack of thunder.
what a fool I've been I wish that it would go and let me cry in vain And let me be alone again Oh, listen to the falling rain Bitter, patter, bitter, patter Oh, listen, listen to the falling rain Bitter, patter, bitter, patter Oh, listen, listen But it, it came out in by the by the by January of '63, "Rhythm of the Rain" had uh, hit the charts at number 80 with a bullet, jumped from 80 up to about 60 something, and then to 40 something, and just kept bouncing up the charts uh, quite quickly. And uh, got to number like, three. I didn't, didn't it? All the way to number three, and it's a it's a lucky number because um, "Rhythm of the Rain" in the uh, year. Well, what they said, I guess when they, uh, when the um, New Century came in, uh, BMI did a list of the, uh, the, the top records in the, in the century. Mm -hmm. And they said that uh, number, Rhythm of the Rain was the ninth most performed song of the whole century. That's so cool. That yeah, is... for, for, for BMI. Now that doesn't include ASCAP, of course. Yeah, and uh, I, as I remember down that list, uh, you've lost that love and feeling by the Righteous Brothers was number one. Number one, yeah, and I and I know this also being a, a major hit in over eighty countries, and it peaked, I think, at number five in the UK singles chart. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, that's quite an accomplishment as well, man. That is just really well, really good stuff. It was interesting that uh, when Rhythm of the Rain hit the charts. Uh, not only did it go up the pop charts to number three, but it, on the adult contemporary charts, it went to number one. And on the rhythm and blues charts, it charted somewhere in the top ten. And so it was like, you know, one of the few rare records that made, made it to three different charts. And uh, that was kind of exciting. <clears throat> and everybody and their brother was covering the song. I mean, let's face it, Rhythm of the Rain is, is not something that uh, is difficult to sing and uh so a lot of different artists all from, from all the way from jan and dean to bobby darren to neil sedaka um johnny rivers uh i mean there was just so many different covers and then there was inst instrumental co covers by uh lawrence welk and um oh lord um percy faith uh floyd kramer uh, just a whole ton of different instrumental covers. And uh, one of my favorites is by, um, oh, the Browns. Do you remember the Browns? I'm not, <clears throat> really not sure if I know who that is. The Browns were the ones that, uh, um, oh, God, they, they had, uh, their, their biggest hit was a, uh, um, about little Jimmy Brown, and he was probably singing about himself. And uh, I don't know. You'd have to, you know, when you're when you got the time, check it out on YouTube. Okay. Uh, Rhythm of the Rain by the by the Browns, and that's Jim Ed Brown, who's you know had a lot of country hits. Oh, okay. And, uh, and uh, it was uh, country wise. I mean, uh, we had I had a hit with top ten hit with Rhythm of the Rain in 1980 with a guy named Jackie Ward. Yeah. And uh, Jackie Ward kind of came and went quietly. He uh, he had a hit with Rhythm of the Rain, but I don't know that he did anything else. You know, I was just talking to somebody yesterday about about Rhythm of the Rain, and that it's just one of those classic songs that are it's just timeless. You know, my wife was saying this morning, you know, she said, "Well, who who are you interviewing today?" And I said, "Well, John Gamow from the Cascades." And she said, "Oh, I love the, I love that song. You know, that's just she's still." To this day, just you know, we can't. It never gets old, you know. No, that's true, and and that that first line has stuck in everybody's minds. I mean, in fact, a lot of people think that's the title of the song. Yeah. Listen to the rhythm of the falling rain, but it, the the actual title is "Rhythm of the Rain." Right. But uh, it's it's uh, it's quite gratifying to know that uh, that I've touched that many people and that uh, something that I created has become that famous 
I mean, there's not a country in the world you can go to without hearing it. That's right. Oh. Yeah, I've I've, I've had uh, fans write to me from places like Cameroon and Syria and uh, places you'd never expect pop music to even be, you know, part of their culture. But uh, a lot of people have heard it. That's terrific. I've, I've, I've probably lost millions of dollars from countries. You know, most of my income over the years has been from BMI, from Broadcast Music Incorporated. Mm -hmm. And uh, the um, that th there's a lot of uh, countries that don't um, uh, they don't come up with any uh, performance money, and one of the worst of them is China. Right. And there's there was probably five different versions of my song in Chinese and uh, other English versions of it in China, and uh, all through the uh, Asian countries. Uh, Thailand, I didn't get, make too much money out of that country. and uh, But all through Asia, Rhythm of the Rain is huge. Well, you know, later on we're going to talk uh, more about the reincarnation of, of the Cascades and, and when you all, you know, uh, got together again and, and did some future touring in, in the Philippines. We'll, right. we'll get to that here shortly. Um, sure. The the success that you had in writing. I mean, there there's quite a few songs that you that you did. What what was the inspiration for the last leaf? You know, I you know I didn't write that, but you did re re record it. You know, and oh I, yes, I thought maybe you could yes. talk about you know what it's about and everything. Well, it's, it was uh, based on a, a poem by a guy named O. Henry, mm -hmm. and uh, it had to do with. In fact, I think that's the name of the poem as well. And it, it and the the lyrics to the last leaf, pretty much are very similar to the poem by O. Henry. And uh, I would say that next to Rhythm of the Rain, the last leaf is one of the biggest uh, thing that people remember from the Cascades and. I think the last leaf made it up to about forty on the charts, maybe, maybe not that high. I'm not sure. I thought somewhere around there. Yeah. And uh, and on the other side, the, the thing with uh, that record, there was a song on the other side of the last leaf called "Shy Girl," mm -hmm. and a lot of people preferred to play that side, so it got split play. And you know what happens to song records that get split play? It it, it also splits up you know, the chart positions. Sure. And it, uh, it, it, you know, if they'd stuck strictly with the last leaf, it probably would have gone a lot higher. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> another one of your covers uh, that received spins in in 1966 was Truly Julie's Blues. Oh yeah, Bob Lind. Yeah. Bob Bob Lind. Uh, my our manager got that song from from Bob, and uh, it. Uh, it was, you know, an interesting song and had interesting lyrics. And, of course, Bob Lind was uh, riding high at that time with his big hit of The Elusive Butterfly. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I thought his writing was pretty sharp and pretty good. And, and we, we also did a song of his called Cheryl's Going Home. In fact, I think it was the other side of Truly Julie's Blues. But, uh, it, it, you know, that... Uh, we we started bubbling under the top uh, 100 on Billboard, mm -hmm. and who should come out with that song but Bob Lind? He he covered the song himself, and so he killed it for himself and us. And mm -hmm. you know, instead of letting you know Truly Julie's Blues go on, because you know if it would, if it had gone up the charts and uh, made it uh, big by us, he would have made a lot more out of it than you know by covering it himself. Forget the definition 
Sure. Well, and in San Diego charts, uh, 69, 1969, here's another rain song uh, that hit number 61, Maybe the Rain Will Fall. Okay, now, I don't know if you know it, but that isn't me. <laughs> yeah, who did that it's, one? Uh, well, I left the group in 1967. I was in the group from uh, 62 to 66, around, that's about four years, I guess, and then I became ill, and I went in the hospital, and Rhythm of the Rain had already peaked, and we had not followed up with a another major hit, and I was beginning to... Um, ponder what I was going to do with myself, uh, and, and I decided to leave the Cascades. And there was a, a singer in San Diego who was with a group called Sandy and the Accents, mm-hmm. and uh, he uh, had had a little bit of uh, success. With, I think they had signed with Liberty Records, and they'd had a little bit of success with some things that they'd recorded, but uh, they weren't doing all that great either. And uh, I think Sandy, who was the lead singer, she was a young gal, and she had a great voice, and uh, she, uh, but eventually, you know, like a lot of the ladies, I mean, she found herself a husband and, and you know, pretty much gave up singing. Yeah. And, uh, but Gabe Lapano, that's the guy's name, Gabe Lapano, came into the Cascades, and I was in the studio when they did that album, because I uh, assisted in the production on it and sang some of the background parts. and uh, But Gabe Lapano was the uh, lead singer uh, on that song. And uh, it didn't really, you know, they had, I think they did two or three albums, uh, that particular um, incarnation of the Cascades, I guess you could call it. and uh, But, you know, it, it, nothing ever further happened. And uh, by that time, I had started doing a solo thing, right. and uh, my manager got me a contract with ABC Dunhill, which was a very uh, big label at that time with uh, the Mamas and the Papas and the Grassroots. Right. And uh, I did a song written by Steve Barry and P.F. Sloan, and, uh, who wrote a lot of uh, things, and uh, I don't know, I don't, I don't know whether they just didn't promote it or whatever, but it quietly died and nothing happened with that. And uh, I, then, I, then, I then went over to Uni Records and signed a contract with Uni Records. And uh, they, uh, they found a song for me that they wanted me to record called Get Around Downtown Girl. You can find that on YouTube as well. Okay. And uh, I uh, <clears throat> did that one record for Uni, and that was in 1969, I believe, or 1970. <clears throat> And Uni had just signed uh, Carly Simon and Elton John. And I, I forget the name of the guy who hit, was the head of Uni Records, but he uh, was a big record man, very well respected and known in the business. And uh, it, it uh, Get Around Town Town Girl, again, quietly died. And then uh, our manager got us another contract with a label called Cream Records. And this was a subsidiary of Liberty, Mm-hmm. And was being um, the CEO of of uh, Cream Records was uh, um, the guy who owned Liberty Al Al Bennett I want to say. <clears throat> anyway, they um, this uh, the son of Al Bennett had Cream Records, and we did two albums with Cream Records, and uh, under the name we had a group. Uh, th- by that time, Gabe Lapano, who he was still working with the Cascades on occasion. But uh, Gabe Lapano and a guy named Kent Morell. <clears throat> Kent was a um, a singer who came out of the Northwest. He was with a group called the Fabulous Whalers. Mm-hmm. And uh, Kent and Gabe and I, we became the we became Kentucky Express. Mm-hmm. And I, I I sometimes think of Kentucky Express as uh, kind of a a cheap knockoff of Crosby, Stills, and Nash. <laughs> but, and I, you know, I'm a harmony freak. I love harmony. Me too. And uh, and that was uh, pretty much what the um, what we did uh, with Kentucky Express. And there, there's some, some really good stuff. There's a song that I really like, and I'm in, and I'm playing it in the episode here uh, called "All the Way to Yesterday." Talk about that. Oh. One. 
that's something that I wrote, and uh, when I um, I did a demo of it uh, all the way to yesterday. Wait a minute, all the way to rest yesterday is a, uh, a composition that was written by myself and my longtime friend and co-writer Lenny Green, and uh, I think there was a gal involved that Lenny had worked with, and uh, Lenny sent me this thing, a demo of it. And I went into my little backroom studio and I did uh, a, a really fairly good recording of All the Way to Yesterday. And uh, it, was, it wasn't until we went to the Philippines that I, um, I also went back into the studio and I played that song for the guy that was our, our musical director at the time for the Philippine trips. And uh, he was also um, an engineer and a guitar player recording uh, he, and, and he sang a little bit. He's, uh, his name is Chuck Cruz. Mm-hmm. And Chuck has, has worked with just about, he worked with uh, Richie Fure. He worked with uh, a lot of different, um, he worked with Ann Margaret in Las Vegas. He's He's been all over the place. And uh, he uh, heard that song and he thought, oh, we got to do something with that. So he we did another new recording of it and he, arranged it, played guitar on it, and we put it on an album that we put out while we were uh, touring and going over to the Philippines a lot. Walking down the sidewalk in my old neighborhood Wanted so to come back Never thought I would This is where I grew up Maybe where I should have stayed Back where childhood memories were made I see all the way to yesterday from here All the loving and the laughter and the tears A window to my I race across the years Looking all the way to yesterday All the way to yesterday All the way to yesterday From here There's the house I lived in Faded now in time Images of family My mama's in the kitchen And my dad's out working hard Me and brother playing in the yard I see all the way to yesterday from here All the loving and the laughter and the tears The window to my
that all started in 2005, by the way, when uh, a promoter from the Philippines, uh, there was a story. <laughs> this is so funny. There was a story in the late 60s. Somebody wrote a newspaper article saying that the Cascades had all died in a plane crash. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I got in touch with, uh, or I, I don't remember... Somebody, somehow or other, this promoter in the Philippines found out that that story wasn't true, and he sent one of his people over here to investigate the whole thing. He came over to my house, and he had me sing a few bars of Rhythm of the Rain for him, and he he called the promoter, and he says, yeah, it's him. He didn't (laughs) die in a plane crash. (laughs) So, and this was in the late 60s, and... uh, so he, he told me, he says, I don't think you even know how huge the Cascades are in the Philippines. Well, talk he about that. Every, you know, I, I'm, I'm, well, I'm really intrigued by, by this. Every, every song on the first Rhythm of the Rain album was a top 10 hit in the Philippines. And uh, probably, as, as in most countries, Rhythm of the Rain was the most popular. But they loved also The Last Leaf and Shy Girl. And we did a, a copy in, in um, do you remember Johnny Burnett's song, Dreamin'? Of course, yeah. Well, Barry Dvorzon wrote that, and he had us cover it on that first album. And uh, that's very popular with the, with the, in the Philippines. And, uh, and I even hear it sometimes on, the, on radio shows here in the States, our version of Dreamin'. And a lot of people like it a lot better than Johnny Burnett's. Sure. But, and then we also covered a song called uh, "Got an Angel on My Shoulder," mm-hmm. and that that had been done a couple of years previously by a gal named Shelby Flint. And Shelby Flint had a big, you know, top ten record with it, as far as I know. And uh, but that was also that that was something that Barry had in his publishing catalog, so he had us uh, do a cover of that, and uh, the. The people in the Philippines loved it, and uh, well, like I said, everything that was on that first album was a smash in the uh, Philippines. And we, when we went over there the first time in 2005, we played at a place in Manila called the Araneta Coliseum, and we we played for a crowd of 16,000 people. Mm-hmm. And but they really had to do some. Uh, some fancy uh, promotion in the Philippines because everybody in the Philippines was convinced that we died in a plane crash. Mm. And then and they thought, oh, they're just sending over a bunch of guys who are... are a tribute are, band are, or imi- something. Yeah, a tribute imitating the Cascades. And so when I went over there, I went over there a little bit early before we did any gigs, and I had to go on radio and TV and, and all the different uh, media outlets there in Manila and uh, and sing a little bit for them, oftentimes a cappella, and uh, maybe or maybe just with a rhythm guitar, and uh, a little by little, you know, the word started getting out that you know that that story was false and that we really were <laughs> yeah. who you know they wanted to hear, and uh, so it was uh, it was it was quite a, a you know a an interesting process to get get them to believe because you know people are funny they hear something that they, oh, that's something that they've heard all their life and then all of a sudden someone turns around and says that's not true oh yeah <laughs> well i'm well i'm thinking about it john i gotta tell you that uh, uh a mutual friend said to say hi to you tom garrett of oh. the classics four Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I worked with Tom over in the Philippines, yeah. That, yeah, that's what he said, and uh, he said, make sure and say hi hi to John for me, so... Yeah, uh, he's a really nice guy, and... Uh, he is. I guess he, he took uh, Dennis Yost's place when uh, Dennis he did. died. He did, yeah. yeah. I've yeah. done a show with him already, uh, oh, two or three two or three shows ago, we, we did one together, and uh, uh-huh. a very nice guy. Yeah, yeah, he, he I really liked him, and uh, yeah, I think we... Uh, we just did the one gig, I think, uh, or maybe some a, a bunch of gigs together. I, I don't remember exactly the circumstances because it's hard to believe that you know a lot of this stuff is already like ten years ago. You know, because I'll be I'll be eighty five this August. 
Well, you sound like you're 30, 37, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know something? Uh, I've never, well, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I guess for an 85-year-old guy, most people that see me and, and, uh, and talk to me and all that, they, they don't, uh, it's hard for them to believe I'm 85, and if they look at me, they always say, oh, you look like you're about 60. Yeah. And uh, I don't know. If, <laughs> I suppose that's a good thing. I don't know. That's a good thing. I mean, I yeah. I get that all the time, too. People say, well, you, you don't look 73 or you know, whatever. So, well, <laughs> it must have been all that good uh, California wine I was drinking when I was out there. There you go. There you go. <laughs> oh, that's that's my uh, my uh, downfall. Or I don't know if it's my downfall, downfall or my uplifting, but I love red wine. Oh, me too. <laughs> me too. Yeah. I, uh, I I drink a couple glasses every night. Before I before COVID hit, I was, uh, you know, I'm not a not an alcoholic. I mean, I was just a social drinker, but but I always yeah. love my wines, you know, and and mm-hmm. you know, drinking moderately, their uh, wine's good for you. So you know, I think so. That's what they say. Yeah, and uh, I'm not much for, uh, you know, once in a blue moon, maybe once a year, I might have a, a martini, a gin martini. Sure. And I like a good martini, and uh, and occasionally I like um, a margarita. Yeah, but I have to be careful because I'm diabetic. Oh yeah, you know a lot of sugar. And in I, that. Yeah. yeah, and I take uh, I I shoot up four times a day with insulin, you know, to uh, keep the blood sugar in check. And my last A one C was five point seven. Oh, that's tremendous. Four, yeah, borderline. Yeah. Well, that's and, uh, no seven seven point one is you know above that is where it, it, it's they don't want you to be, but but yeah, anything mm-hmm. below seven you're doing okay. So five five is yeah. great, man. That's good. Yeah, I'm doing I'm doing something right. Yeah, and, you uh, are. Yeah, you, know, you know, but you know, at eighty five, I mean, you know, it's it's more difficult for me to get around. I'm having trouble squatting and kneeling, and then trying to get back up again, things like that, and it just all comes with the age I'm at, and. Uh, because I know just about everybody that I know that's around my age, they all have trouble with things like that. Oh yeah, they're all getting their knees done and hips replaced and all that. You exactly, know, so. all that stuff. Yeah, all that I, stuff. I, my knees and my hip. Well, I don't know. Uh, I don't know whether it's my legs or my. I don't think it's my knees or my hips because uh, I walk pretty good and I walk usually at a pretty brisk pace when I do walk. Mm-hmm. But uh, but, uh, but as far as um, like I said. If I have to get down to look into it, like a cabinet that's uh, close to the floor, I've got to have something nearby that I can grab a hold of and push myself back up again. Sure. And uh, but that's you know, I'll, I can live with that, and I suppose I'll be around you know for who knows, you know when you get to be in your mid eighties, uh, you're just glad you got up in the morning. <laughs> well, yeah, it's 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 a good thing. Back yeah. back to the music here. There was a song yeah. that I heard you do that I that I really liked, and, and you know we were talking about harmonies earlier. I really love the harmonies in this song, and it's called Happiness. Talk about that one. Oh, that's interesting. That's something I did in my little backroom studio. That whole thing was recorded right here in my home, and uh, it never got recorded, and it was never. I mean, it never you know actually was put out for sale. Let's put it that way. Right, and. Uh, yeah, I, I had a lot of fun with that, you know, and, and because I'm such a harmony freak, maybe I overdid it a little bit, but uh, <laughs> I, but it was fun. I enjoyed it, and uh, I introduced it to uh, my Facebook uh, crowd, and uh, I'm on Facebook primarily because there's a lot of other artists that also do Facebook. Sure, me, and, me as uh, well. And yeah. yeah, and there's people that um, on Facebook that uh, are in a position to do things with with other people's stuff if they chose to, although that's never happened to me. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's a, uh, thank you for that. I, I, uh, that's one of my favorite things that I've done. Have you walked the canyon trail with your lady? 
the rhythm of the Epinesia Hills. Have you seen the desert sky at night? Felt a high Sierra chill. Have you made love, my friend, on a bed of old pine needles? Wish you could know that kind of thrill. Well, I know about all those things, so listen to me good, and I'll tell you about happiness. Can't you see it's wrong to drive yourself on? Gotta get back to the land and find yourself a piece of happiness. A little bit of happiness. I just want to say one more thing. When we were recording Rhythm of the Rain in uh, in Gold Star Studios in San Diego, where uh, Phil Spector had his wall of sound, mm-hmm. and uh, Phil Spector came into the studio while we were listening to Rhythm of the Rain, the playback, and he said, oh, what are you guys doing, cutting a demo for Ricky Nelson? <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> I, I, got... I just wanted to put that, put that little thing, because... Most people get a big kick out of that, and if they know who Phil Spector is, and because he was such a, f- a famous uh, part of that era. Well, he was, and I and I've got a Phil Spector story uh, that I'll, I'll share with you real quick. We um, when we were playing out in L.A., um, we we got to know uh, a, a, an all Korean female group that we uh-huh. performed with up in. Um, Winnipeg, Manitoba. We would do a show starting at four or five in the afternoon. They would do a show. We'd do a show. And this went on till about 12 at night. It was, uh, we did like three or four shows each group each night. And, uh, we, we got to be real good friends with the Day Han sisters. These are all, like I said, all Korean group, all uh, female. Right. And, uh, anyway, we had, um, gotten to know this group real well and stayed in touch with them. And, and anyway, so we, we ended up coming back to LA. We were t- touring all over the U S but we ended up coming back to LA and we were playing out in uh, West Covina at a place called Rubens, uh, dinner, dinner showroom. And, uh, uh-huh. and they, uh, the day sisters were off for a week and, and, and a lot of them lived in Las Vegas and, and some out in LA. And anyway, Wani, the drummer, she was going to see her boyfriend who uh, who she wanted to bring to come in to see our our group and so she called my wife we were living in Newport Beach at the time and she called my wife she says Sharon she said I'm here visiting my boyfriend we'd like to uh, I'd like to bring him in to see the band and Sharon says well sure you know I I was there last night but I'll I'll be glad to come back again tonight if you want to you know, if you want to bring him, oh, she, oh no, we can't tonight because me and my boyfriend we're going to go uh, go to dinner with Engelbert Humperdinck, and <laughs> and Sharon goes, well, excuse me, you know, so, <laughs> but she says, but we but we can come tomorrow night, and so so they came, and um, little did we know who her boyfriend was at the time, but uh, long story short, and I'll cut right into this. This was. Uh, Mike Stone, the famous Mike Stone, who uh, took Priscilla Presley away from Elvis when they broke up. Oh, really? And okay. Mike and Mike Stone was Phil Spector's personal bodyguard. Uh-huh. He also did a lot of the like the Bruce Lee type movies, you know, Kung Fu and all these different movies. The guy's a tenth degree black belt and uh, an amazing martial artist. And and I and I bring this story up because he lives in the Philippines. He is an oh, amazing okay. individual and you can uh you can go to my Talk and Rock radio show on YouTube and dial it back to about 2 plus years ago and one of my first interviews was with Mike Stone from the Philippines. And uh, the 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 craziest part of doing that interview and you'll appreciate this is that 
because of the major time change, it's like 16 hours different time zone than what sure. we're what we're in. So we had to yeah. pick we had to pick a time that was uh, good for him and good for me, where we w- both weren't either either one of us sleeping or whatever. So we yeah. fi- finally worked that out. But his dojo, where he works there in in the Philippines, is right on the ocean, right on the water. People can go. Uh, to this day, and spend time with him for a fee, of course. But he uh, uh-huh. he trains them spiritually and in the in in the sport of martial arts. And uh, an amazing individual. Anybody that listens to that show will definitely learn some things that you probably didn't know. But uh, uh, uh-huh. we didn't talk too much about. Uh, we talked a little bit about Phil Spector and all that. But you know, and and I think we touched on on. Uh, uh, a little bit about Priscilla, I think, but, but, but the best part about all that is that we got to meet him and he, he came in to see our show that night and we had a, a great conversation with him and, um, uh, very interesting individual. And, and he is you know, living in the Philippines with his wife. It's really a pretty neat, uh, great, yeah, pretty neat life. But it's, uh, you know, living in the Philippines, I mean, it's so much cheaper than living here. Mm-hmm. Number one, and uh, number two, I mean, you, if you live in the Philippines and you've got even a, a small amount of money, you can have a driver, you can have a cook, you can have a full-time house cleaner, you can, you know, uh, have all these things that over here would cost you a fortune, and you'd have to be, you know, a, a pretty wealthy to have all that. Mm-hmm. But over there, you don't have to be that wealthy to live that kind of life. We, I, I thought about buying... Uh, they were trying to sell me an island at one point. <laughs> but, and, you know, there. I mean, what a, I, I don't remember how many thousands of islands make up the archipelago, but it's 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 amazing. Oh, it's, it's amazing! Uh, thousands. There's many, yeah. many, many, many. Yeah, that's that's pretty crazy. You really made your way, John, and I. You know, I want to thank you for for being a part of my Talk and Rock Radio show today. You know. Um, You've left your mark, you know, in the golden era of rock and roll, a period of, of time that I just, you know, I I say it all the time. Music in the in the golden era of rock and roll is is so I don't know, it's timeless. You know, you back in those days the music was the best, you know. And Oh yeah, I agree totally. And those of us that grew up in that time, you know, we'll talk about it to our to our dying day. I mean, you know, it's just sure. the music was so incredible, you know, and I Absolutely. I, I want to thank you for for sharing your passion and and especially your talent. You know, you you are one of the great ones and I, I really appreciate you being a part of my show today and 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 sharing some of your stories and your history. Yeah, it was my pleasure. I enjoyed it tremendously. And uh yeah. anyway, well thanks so much and uh and uh, good luck with everything. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Sure. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.